welcome to the If You Build It, Will They Learn podcast, a show dedicated to modern learning and development with your hosts, Daniel Mendonca and Scott Babcock. It's podcast day. Welcome to the show. This is If You Build It, Will They Learn. I'm Scott Babcock and I am here with your co-host, Daniel Mendonca, and a special guest this week. We have Katie Lucas in studio, a virtual instruction partner, uh, here to talk with us today and just kind of gab around, and we're going to chat a little bit of L&D. Uh, really excited to have Katie in, in studio, if you will, with us today. Daniel and Katie, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Scott. Um, today in, in Ontario, we entered stage two of reopening. I know things are a little different over there in the U.S., but stage two of reopening here. I'm also double-dosed as of yesterday, so... Big day. Add a boy. Add a boy. Awesome. Well, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. All is well down here in Pennsylvania, too. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, Danny, when you go to your, get your second dose, do you do it in a clinic or is it like a pop up shop? That's what they're on. It's the like US. vaccination clinic. Clinic is what they're calling them, but like they took an old Sears in in our mall and they like redid it and then the other one was in like a hockey arena like first dose was hockey arena second dose was sears so yeah it's it feels very much like i'm watching a movie the whole time which is weird like i'm in a movie it's just it was it was a little bit a little bit eerie but yeah so for ours they set up tents and parking lots and you just drive through i don't know what it's like yeah uh, oh. That was a little bit of a uh, fun diversion, but today we're going to be talking about facilitation. Um, uh, we wanted to bring Katie on to shed some light and some expertise on exactly, as a facilitator, how she motivates uh, the people in her classrooms. And we're going to talk a little bit about the transition between live and virtual as well, get her insights, and just uh, generally talk about all things facilitation and, and what's happening in the L&D industry that she's excited about. So really excited to get started. Without further ado, let's kick it off. As we begin our first segment, we obviously want to start at the beginning. Katie, we want to get to know you a little bit better and introduce you to the audience and, and just find out uh, all about you. So if you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're kind of working on right now, that would be awesome. Yeah, I'd love to. So um, from a professional standpoint, I've I've only been in L&D for about six years now. So I don't know. I, I guess I consider myself kind of a newbie. Um, perhaps. Um, and like you said earlier, my most recent role is virtual instruction partner, which is a really exciting new role that they just created, you know, especially as we are making a transition into, um, you know, just more virtual learning and virtual instruction led uh, courses versus always just an in-person in-classroom uh, role. Um, the other cool thing about this role is that I'm getting to dabble in instructional design a little bit. So that's been really fun, mostly focusing on leadership development and things like that. Um, from a personal standpoint, I live outside of Philadelphia. Uh, I'm a girl mom, so I'm the opposite of you, Scott. Um, <laughs> uh, Net Netflix binger, I'd say, social media creeper. I love the TikTok, Daniel, by the way, super funny. Um, and I'm also a motivational junkie. So I'm super excited to be talking with you in the month of motivation, right? I dig it. Da Daniel is a girl dad, so uh, you guys share that in common as well. Yes. So he has a little daughter, so yes, uh, I. Uh, it's she brings me to my most vulnerable state. I can pretty much, <laughs> if you need to ask anything of me, do it when I'm around my daughter. <laughs> you can't say no to, in front know. of her. That's what it comes to. Yeah. <laughs> well, they know how to to work work the dad for sure. That's for sure. So let's talk a little bit. You said uh, you've been in L&D for about six years. Um, what brought you or what was sort of your path to get into L&D, knowing it is a little newer for you? We always find it interesting to find out how people got here, because uh, I think everyone's path is always a little bit different. Yeah, sure. Um, so before getting into this, I was actually a former grade school teacher. Um, and I love teaching, but I guess I just felt that the elementary grades weren't really where my sweet spot was. So um, after a few years, I left that and I, I really just took on an entry level administrative role with a, with a company um, where I learned that L&D was actually a thing. I, I guess I was just so always caught up in, you know, if you want to do education, you be a teacher. Um, but where my office was, I literally shared a wall with a training center. So I basically went, well, 
I mean, I have this degree in education. I've done this. So like, how do I do that job? And, uh, essentially long story short, I just kept asking that question, like to everybody, like, how do I do that? How do I get into that? How do I get into that? Um, and followed the development plan that, you know, I worked with the company to, to lay out for me and did a lot of networking and, and finally they gave it to me. So I don't know. I, think it, <laughs> I find it really interesting because I don't think you're alone in a lot of, uh, maybe those that are more started their careers in more of a traditional educational space, not always thinking about the fact that corporations and organizations have to train their people too. Uh, you kind of forget that, uh, that was the path not too far off. I was going to be a high school teacher. Um, and just didn't quite see that as my ultimate career path and never put two and two together that there would also be education opportunities within an organization and stumbled into it. Not unlike you had a role that was not necessarily uh, in that space. I worked for a large retailer and, just happened somebody introduced me to the fact that oh yeah by the way for the last seven years you've been getting trained and I was like hey wait I actually like training and that was how I got there was just kind of pursued an opportunity within that so yeah I, we don't always make that connection I think it's so common we we hear it a lot about people who who end up like in L&D just in a roundabout way I think obviously from whether it's marketing or, or human resources or other other places or traditional education yet to hear a real concrete story of like I grew up and I knew I wanted to be an L and D manager or, or an instructional designer. Um, and there's also not a lot of, um, institutions around that, that do offer, um, you know, adult learning theory, you know, it, it's out there, but it's also difficult to come across. So you, you typically, it's usually a learned skill as you progress through different areas and then, and then you find a passion for it, which I know Katie, you do have. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're right where, you know, and that's where I think my mindset was where I love teaching because I love like seeing the light bulbs go off in people's heads as you tell, you know, they, as they figure something out um, and just being in a group of people who want to to learn and develop. It's just a really fun experience. And, and you always kind of make that connection. Well, then I guess that's school. But then when you go into that higher education, it's it's like elementary ed or secondary ed or special ed or something like that. Um, and you don't really get introduced to it um until i think there's some like master's programs on stuff where you can kind of go a little bit deeper into things like the curriculum design or instruction design um but yeah you're absolutely right and and it was the same thing like i said i, I saw that going on and i was like well that looks cool i could totally do that um so how do i do that <laughs> what what's the what's the biggest difference if you had to put your finger on something between, um, we, and we've talked about the difference between um, children learning and adults uh, learning on the podcast, but what have you seen or, or the different ways you have to approach things from a traditional perspective or just, you know, thinking outside the box? Um, well, the kids thought I was a lot more funnier for one, <laughs> for one thing. <laughs> um, no, but um, on a serious note, you know, I, I think with, with children, they're just, they're just intrinsically eager to learn. Whereas adults are kind of like, why do I got to change? <laughs> What's wrong? What's in this for me? Um, so, you know, really making sure you're, you're talking about that a lot, um, was a big transition for me, right? We're really focusing on like how this is going to help them make their job easier, so to say. I love it. That sounds like a perfect transition into our topic for today. So um, let's go on ahead and we'll start talking about what motivates people uh, in that adult learning space. All right. So Katie mentioned the idea that uh, adult learners have different motivations. And, and with our topic being motivation and what drives people to want to learn this month, um, I think that that sets us up nicely to talk a little bit about what those things are. So Katie, when, when you're in a classroom um, and obviously you can bring in as much of the, the, the elementary level education, formal education, if you will, versus adult, if you want. But when we think about adult learners specifically, what do you think are those like key motivators that an adult you kind of have to address or talk about to get them excited or and get them engaged? Um, that's a, that's a great question, Scott. And, Honestly, the first thing that pops into my head is I think it's something that kids just do naturally. And that's 
you know, ask why, <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's like, no matter what you do, it's like, but why, but why, but why? Um, and I think adult learners have that same question, but maybe they're not as verbal saying that, <laughs> right? So they, they need to know why they need to go to training or why sh they should develop. Um, so, you know, sharing the purpose, um, for, for everything, for whether it be why they're at the course, why you're doing certain activities within the course, um, to really outline how this is going to help them, how it's going to make their job easier, um, how it's going to help them make better decisions, whatever, whatever it is, um, going back to, to why, even if they're not asking. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, I, and I think, you know, all of us have kids now too. And the why is often more just seeking information. I think when you think of kids, right, it's, but why, but why, but why, because they need that little bit of explanation. But the why I think for an adult, a lot of times is maybe more intellectual. It's, it's understanding a deeper cause or a deeper objective that applies to them specifically. Um, I think typically with, when I think of the way kids learn, they think of learning as just, well, this is something that's part, it's natural, right? My teacher's telling me this is as important. And so I, I just take that at, at face value. But I think adults don't always see that in, inherent value just because someone said to do it. Um, and so I think you do have to dive into the, what is the why for them specifically? And that, that can be really diverse. Yeah, for sure. And I think you, you tie in a little bit of the, do I want to learn this and do I, do I need to learn this? Again, kids, it's kind of like, well, you have to go to school because you have to. So you need to. Yep. Whereas, you know, as an adult, you have more choices. And it's like, so do I need to? And do I want to? So even if I'm like being told by my boss that I've got to go to this course. So, yeah, I got to go. But do I really want to? Um, For sure. Again, when, when you make it relevant and you're really sharing about, you know, the, that purpose. Um, I think it, it makes them want to be there and want to learn. Do you, do you find with the, with the why? Cause I think it, it, it always, sometimes in a negative way, always goes in the back of people's minds of like, why am I doing this? Uh, when you think about adults, um, do you find that they're hesitant to ask why, or is there a reason you can put your finger on for that? Do you think? Um, so I, I think it's, I think we're, when we find something that works, we just feel comfortable. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, they, they do ask sort of why we have to do this, especially if what they've already been doing is working just fine. If it's, if it's not broke, then why fix it? Um, but there's also value in trying new things and, and being innovative um, to just keep growing. For sure. So with the idea of, yeah, you, you mentioned a couple times there, the, the notion that I've been doing it this way for so long, or I feel really comfortable doing it in, you know, the ABC format. Now you want me to go to the XYZ format. Um, obviously there's a barrier there that's all around change. And if we think about the last two years, and you mentioned kind of that you you have fairly recently shifted from maybe the live and in-person classroom to the virtual space. Um, obviously the last two years has kind of thrown all of that into turmoil, right? With the pandemic and everything else, people not being able to be physically present. What are some of the things in that L and D space that you, let's start with some of the things you've had to address in terms of getting people used to using a virtual platform or using the virtual space in terms of change management? What are some of the things that you find are inherently problematic or troublesome uh, barriers for people as they go into that learning space? Oh man, I love this question. It's, there's a lot of change within this going into a virtual setting, right? With um, not maybe understanding the technology for one thing, right? I don't know. I think a lot of people are more aware of technology and how to use it because it's just all around us all the time. But then when you're saying, again, to change, like, well, why can't we just go to the classroom and do it? Why do we have to learn this, these other new platforms? Um, is one thing. And then on the other side is also thinking about like, if they are using technology, what are they using? Are they on a computer? Are they on a tablet? Or are they on like a mobile device? And how does that impact what the content looks like or how they can actually engage and interact? Um, another thing that we're learning is 
how much they think can't happen virtually, where we hear that a lot, where it's, it's like, well, in a course, we would role play, you can't do that virtually. And, you know, pushing it back in this by saying, like, why not? <laughs> um, like, well, then what are other ideas that, you know, why do we do role play? And what are maybe some other ideas we can come up with to still get that same outcome of practice and so forth? Um, why do we have to say that it just won't work? Like, just give it a try. You never know. Um, and there are, you know, so many different platforms and applications or things like that, that um, we're all learning together, I think, to, to, to be able to change those, what were typically the normal, you know, in, in classroom training activities for a whiteboard or for a role play or for a small group discussion and and what does that look like virtually? So, um, you know, learning about all that stuff and then teaching them how to use all those things and then putting it all together um, is a big change for everybody, I think. I love the idea that, uh, again, just asking why uh, it works for, ask why, always ask why. Because I, I like the idea of like, well, yeah, we've done maybe a traditional role play, but it's not the role play necessarily that is the outcome, right? Uh, what is the objective of a role play? And it's practice and it's interaction and it's whatever, but are there other ways we could be utilizing that given a new space and a new box to fit in, if you will? Um, and just saying like, it wasn't really about a role play. It was about this outcome or this objective, which we talk about a lot, that taking it back to what was the original intent uh, and then just saying, like, how do we adapt, right? How do we move this into the new space, whether it's new technology or new environments, uh, new processes, and just it's really adhere to those objectives. And you can still have an activity that, that plays out. It just plays out in a different sense. And being open to that is usually the biggest biggest hurdle. I find uh, you're, you're spot on on that. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you deal with, and I know, Katie, you had a, um, a really great, I think, curriculum or group of content at an event earlier this year that that I, I really thought was, was super interesting, which we can dive into a little bit. But do you think the technology that people interact with on a daily basis, um, we mentioned TikTok, uh, Instagram, if you think about Vine in the past, YouTube, so do you think that has an influence on how they approach learning like in the corporate world or, or does it cross over at all? Um, I think it could. <laughs> um, you know, if, if we want it to go that way, or if people were open to that, um, you know, if you think about it, I don't know about you guys, but you know, if I want to learn how to do something new, there's oftentimes where I'll just Google it and it'll, and it might take me to, um, some kind of blog or some kind of YouTube video. And, and that's how I, I learn these things. And so how cool is it that in this new space, we can utilize that. Right. So instead of having to watch an instructor in front of a class all day, you know, you can say you can, you know, be on something like Teams or whatever, but then shift over to, hey, go watch this YouTube video. Um, you can interact after the course via some kind of social media platform, whether that be Instagram or Facebook or, um, you know, something like Slack or, or one of those other, you know, forums to, to be able to have discussions and ask questions you know, even after or before a course is really cool. I think it, it does open up some of those really different avenues for communication and almost pre and post that has always been, I mean, historically, again, from my time in the classroom was always the hardest part. How do you get them engaged before they get here? And how do you keep them engaged after they leave? You only get them for that window of time that are actually in your face. And I think virtual potentially opens up these it, it reduces the barrier to getting them into talking and interacting or completing content, getting ahead of the curve before they arrive and then keeping them dialoguing after the fact by giving them some other opportunities that maybe weren't there before. And, um, we're, and I was going to say, Scott, we're seeing that a lot, even in the virtual event space and not just necessarily with our customers, but a lot of others where um, the, the talk isn't about going back to fully in person. It's about how do I create a hybrid experience so I can engage people more frequently in different means. So, you know, if I attend a conference internally, how can there be some sort of cascading virtual experience after the fact that allows people to continue to engage with that content, be reaffirmed, um, and check in with people kind of in a community style, um, format. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that as well, Katie. Yeah. 
um, definitely, I love the the idea of even just reinforcement because, um, you know, even if it was an in-person class or a virtual instructor-led class, you may have, you know, there was all, the whole content and, and maybe there were two or three things that really stuck to you. But then if you can though, then go back and access some of these other resources, whether it be now go watch this recording or go listen to this podcast or go read this article, it's building on or, you know, reaffirming things that were also taught, but maybe they didn't catch it the first time around. Um, so it keeps the learning going. And that's always been a challenge. I think even in the planning and curriculum development is how do you, how do you get that reinforcement? And I think this is a new world that we're living in. It's another, I have another good que- uh, question that I think sprouts from that. And it, it's simply just with all the change that's happening as we move into a virtual space, uh, we've talked about the barriers and some of the challenges maybe that uh, a learner goes through or a facilitator goes through. Have you found something uh, that you're really, really excited about, whether it's technology or an approach, software, or application? Um, is there anything out there that you're like, this is going to be, maybe it's game changing or just really fun. Uh, fun. We love the idea of fun and education uh, mix, mixing together. I think it improves our retention. But is there anything out there that you're just super gung-ho or excited about? Uh, currently in the virtual space specifically? Um, yeah, so I, I think just being able to integrate more technology into courses is really cool. Um, and I mean, you can still use it if it's an in-person class where it's maybe instead of having an actual flip chart with markers where they're writing stuff, you can still have small groups where maybe they're on like a jam board and and building a whiteboard that way, um, because <laughs> I mean they're 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 probably carrying around their phone anyway, and they're going to want to be looking at it or they're going to be playing on it. And so why not put it to use so that they're they don't have that as a distraction, and instead it's just an extra learning tool, right? So I mean, pulling software instead of just doing like a raise your hand. How about you actually? you know, use something on their phone where they can see real time, like what the poll looks like. And I know there's a couple different um, applications or, or websites out there that can that can do that. Um, so that's been really cool. And, and again, that can also just be used in virtual or it can be used in person. So harnessing that dish that was previously maybe a distraction into something that can just add value to the course. I love that. I love the idea that, yeah, you're right. It, that was always probably, I'm, w- we can talk about it, you know, how do you keep people motivated and, and, and we will for sure, but uh, phones are always a distraction point. And if you can invite that into the classroom and make it a tool rather than a distraction, I think it's an awesome idea. Yeah. I mean, there's still, <clears throat> it, it can still get tricky, right? Where they can still like, oh, I answered the poll. Now let me go check this text <laughs> message real quick, but um, we'll get there. Again, it, it's part of that change. It's just getting used to, um, you know, how to work around that. All right, so we talked a lot about some of the really positive things that are coming out of uh, change in the adult learning theory world, both virtual and in classroom. We've talked about some of the challenges and some of the the, the barriers that might exist for some folks. Um, but one of the things I'd love to talk about now is just, you know, motivation obviously is the topic of the month. But let's talk a little bit about, as a facilitator, how do you keep people motivated in a classroom? And that, that is not necessarily to say that every classroom is the same or that every classroom is unmotivated necessarily. But when we think about it, are there any kind of tips or tricks you have for the audience, Katie, in terms of things you employ to keep people going, uh, particularly in some of these sessions are four, six, eight hours, uh, not so much maybe in the virtual space, but definitely in the live space. What do you do uh, to kind of keep people engaged and keep them energized? Um, well, like I said earlier, my humor doesn't work as well with the adults as the kids, but I do try to to trickle that in there. Um, no, but in seriousness, um, really what that all comes down to is building the rapport, uh, with the team in front of you. Um, Daniel, I think you had said before, or maybe it's what you actually do, right? Is you're, you're in sales, right? And yep. training is a lot like sales in that we're really trying to influence someone to do something. So mm-hmm. getting to know those, your learners and connecting with them is huge because it's basically just like sales. It's like sales 101 is, you know, connecting with your customer. Um, so getting to know them, getting to know them, like just asking them a lot of questions 
um, is going to, you know, it, it helps create this safe zone. So whether you're in a classroom or, or whether it's virtual, it, they feel like they're invited to be there. It's a safe space to be. Um, and I think it, that comes down to also with training, it's remember that it's always about them and not you. So the more you get to know them and the more you can connect with them or show them that you're just like them, um, creates that environment where they're going to be comfortable and, and motivated to, to hear what you've got to say. I love, I love that approach and, and kind of the way you worded it. I, I feel like in, in its simplest form, when I think about sales, but even in, in training or coaching or wherever you're in is, is once your agenda becomes like our agenda, because of you listening and driving that conversation um, around that, it becomes so much easier to keep people moving in, in a common direction um, and being motivated to continue to participate because they feel like it's their own. Um, and it, rather than it being, well, Katie's coming to class today and she's going to teach me stuff. It's we're, we're going to class today to learn or improve or get better. And I think that that transition and s- similar to sales where it's like, well, Daniel's going to sell me something rather than like, we're going to find a solution that's best for me, which I think is a completely different mentality, which obviously helps drive. So I, I love that approach you, you take. I like that. Um, you mentioned sort of this safe space and I often as L and D folks, I think we forget there's a certain amount of vulnerability, right. With someone coming into a classroom and you know, they're being one potentially thrown into a classroom with a bunch of people they don't know, which is always, uh, can be really daunting for some people. If you're not sort of the social butterfly or networker, you might feel really un- like that might already put you in a place where it's, man, it's a bunch of people I don't know. And I'm, they're going to ask me questions. If you're like me, I don't love role playing. So that whole exercise is always like a stress inducer for me. Um, and so I, I, I think that knowing that is part of it, plus you're being challenged to potentially reframe your, you know, depending on where you have preconceived notions and stuff, like you might be saying, I'm already defensive about this, or they're going to, they're going to try to push me in a way I don't feel comfortable with because I already do it this way. Um, and they, you have to overcome some of that. So I think knowing that people come into a, a, a training space, not always in the best frame of mind from to absorb um, because of a lot of factors. Um, I think that's really important to know that they need to understand that this is, this is a place where it's, it's about support and it's about trust and it's about growth and that, uh, you have to be comfortable in that space in order to absorb any of it. And I, I think that's an approach that doesn't maybe get addressed as often as it uh, should. I think I like that approach a lot because I think it's forgotten many times. Yeah. And and taking what you're learning from them and using it or, or you know, weaving it within the content too. So if you're saying something, you can say, you know, oh, Scott, you said something earlier about this and it reminded me of this and, and tying it all together so that they can see also that you know, their past experiences relate to what we're also learning now. And then here's how it can be in the future. Right. So not just kind of asking a question and then not really ever using it again or, or coming back to it. Right. Makes it feel like inauthentic or something like that. But when you can weave it back in um, it, they can feel included like, wow, I've actually contributed to part of this course because you've, you've talked to them. Um, and like you said, maybe they're, they're going to be more likely to be vulnerable and ask the questions that are maybe still in their head that they were maybe too shy to before or something like that. When you, uh, I, I, I'm always of sort of two minds on this. If you have someone or some people in a class that are pretty quiet, maybe they sit in the back, they don't ask a lot. Are you of the mindset of you should sort of draw them out via direct questions like, hey, Katie, what do you think about this? You've been pretty quiet today, or are you more of an organic, let them kind of come to it through activities and stuff? Uh, Cause I think you can go both directions. I'm just always curious. And I never know which one I prefer. Yeah, that is, that is a tough question. And, and honestly, um, I relate to it so hard too, because I'm, I'm that introvert. So even though I'm a facilitator and I, I'm literally in front of groups of people really often when it's on the, when I'm on the other side, I'm, I'm, I hide, right? So I'm not as talkative. I'd rather just make notes um, and research it later or something. I won't raise my hand and ask it. Um, but I still like to have them feel included. And I, and I think a good way to do it is 
by kind of giving them like a little of a softball. So when you're asking them a question, but make it like an easy question um, or something that doesn't really have a wrong answer so that they can actually speak up and then say, oh, well, that wasn't so bad. I, I lived. <laughs> um, and then I think that kind of wakes them up and, and gets them engaged. It's a good approach. I like that. I had a, I had a university professor and it's one of the classes that I did best in. It was international business class. And I loved the way he facilitated because most of my class was conversation um, around topics and, and that, which I love, but I, I also love to listen. I, I, I don't, I try to only talk when I, I necessarily need to, especially when it's something I'm not super comfortable with. And he never, ever called on anybody to answer a question specifically, but he always made sure that all different areas and people were involved. So like, if he saw me listening, he'd be like, Hey, Daniel, do you have something to add to that? Do you want to add to the conversation and like facilitate, which I thought was really welcoming in the sense of like, Hey, don't feel pressure. If you're sitting and listening intently, that's fine. Um, which I, I thought was a great experience for me because it made me seem like he wanted me to, to give to the class rather than just, you know, answer this question because so I can see if you're paying attention or not, which I think can be tough sometimes. For sure. Did anyone else right now just get a, an image of Daniel, as he mentioned, international business? I had Daniel dressed as like Austin Powers, international man of business. Um, I don't know why. I'll, put it on I a t-shirt, really Scott. I had a really hard time like focusing in on what you were saying because I was just getting this mental <laughs> image. That's, that's uh, sorry that's about that. Uh, yeah, they, these are the left-hand turns we take in the show every once in a while. So, uh, no, I love all of uh, those in terms of keeping people motivated and just you know, acknowledging the fact that uh, not everyone comes with that ready built energy or, or comfort level. And, and how do you kind of get people to a place where they start to feel more comfortable? I think those are great ways to kind of draw them into the, into uh, the training or the conversation. So they do feel more of a part of it and hopefully maybe feel that level of comfort ease for them uh, so that they can keep contributing. So I love it. This has been a great conversation today. Katie, we want to say thank you uh, for joining us, uh, but we're not done yet. Uh, we still have to get happy. We've got our positivity point to draw in as well. So we're going to finish the show just like every other episode. It's time. We end every show with uh, just a happy moment, a little positivity that we try to bring back to the audience uh, and just to kind of brighten your day a little bit. We have a special guest on the show. Guests should always go first. So Katie, why don't we hand the ball to you? What is happy and positive in your life today that you want to share with the group? Oh, gosh. I am so excited. So this coming weekend is a holiday weekend down here for us uh, in the U.S. So I am so excited to be going to the beach on Saturday for the week. Uh, Very finally, nice. Finally vacation. Very nice. Yes. Very nice. Ready to get my, my feet in the sand. Relax. So are you are you off all of next week? I did take vacation off all next Fantastic. week. Fantastic. Yeah, me too. I'm <laughs> excited about that. Um, by the way, it is also a holiday weekend in Canada. Um, Canada Day is to, is tomorrow. Um, we don't count so, the Canadian holidays, Daniel. Well, no. I think he right, just said enough. we can start tomorrow. That yeah, I think too. longer weekend. Okay, never mind. We'll, we'll take in all the Canadian holidays. Exactly. Exactly. There we go. I love it. Well, I, I'm going to... I'm going to piggyback on that because uh, mine also is, this is the 4th of July weekend um, and it is my wife's favorite holiday. Um, she is, it's a like, I don't think it's normal, but uh, it, it does come from her dad and her, and she were uh, very into fireworks. And so it's uh, in a memorial kind of, I think uh, a happy moment for her to remember her dad. Um, and so she loves the 4th of July. I think we're having like 30 or 40 people over for like a barbecue and fireworks. It gets a little crazy in our cul-de-sac. Um, I don't know how many thousands of dollars of fireworks will be set off in the cul-de-sac, uh, but every year is just kind of a big block party. So a lot of fun is had uh, on this weekend. Uh, but I also have a second one. I was going to try to hold these back, but I am super excited for this. Um, the baseball season, as we know, we talk a lot of, about my son's baseball team uh, on the show and it obviously there are many positivity points however their season is basically wound down and they sort of have like a fun tournament here at the end it's a little four person or 14 uh deal and on friday night the boys are getting coached by their moms um so the dads all the all the guys who typically coach uh and the coaches we're gonna go sit out in the outfield and just be fans and the moms are going in and they are going to coach so they're taking over the head coaching first base third base they're going to do the lineup cards. They're going to do the pitching and everything else. 
And possibly the best part is that they're changing all of their walk-up songs. And so what once was, uh, you know, Crazy Train by Ozzy Osbourne and whatever other hip-hop songs they want to put out there, and these super heavy promotional things are now going to be My Heart Will Go On by Celine Dion <laughs> and Let It Go from Frozen. And these boys don't know it's happening Listen, yet. Listen, let it, let it Go is a banger. Oh, well, well, for sure, for sure. I can't wait to see when the first boy walks up and I don't know, Whitney Houston is all of a sudden belting out a ballad as his walk-up song. The look on his face uh, will be priceless, to say the least. So um, we also are hoping that they just dominate for their moms, and then maybe the dads just take up uh, a more leisurely approach out in the outfield. Just saying. Uh, but I have, we're super excited for it. This has been planned for months. Um, in fact, they had a coaches meeting. Uh, all the moms got together yesterday and had a coaches meeting on exactly what their game plan was for Friday night. So uh, it should be a blast. I'm super excited for it. I know the moms are really pumped, and I think secretly the boys are too. Awesome. Scott, I just want to say I absolutely love every second of that. As a uh, sports, you know, youth sports guy, I think that is incredible. I think it's also a huge show of of community, which is fantastic. Um I'm going to, I'm going to hop on to the sports. I'm also going on, on PTO next week and we can't go to many places yet in Ontario still, but I'm putting my feet up and, um, relaxing, which is going to be exciting and disconnecting, which as you know, Scott and Sabrina, I'm not very good at, um, but I'm going to try my hardest and, uh, but that's not my positivity point. My positivity point is today, as I mentioned, we entered stage two. The best part about stage two is it means there are zero restrictions around soccer as of today. So Mm -hmm. Um, absolute. I know sport has been back and youth sport has been back in, in the U S for a while, but, um, complete games and everything else is back for, for kids. And I'm not worried so much about my university season so much, but like seeing the excitement, I stopped by the field the other, um, the other day when it was partially restrictions. And I know this weekend, the kids are excited to play games and that excites me. So I'm looking forward to, to just seeing the field back to normal a little bit, no masks, um, everybody interacting the way we used to and, and, uh, seeing kids react to that because they're just so excited. So today's That's a big awesome. day in Ontario. I feel like I we should it. already have been here, but I'm not a medical professional, so I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> no, it's, it's great to have a little bit of normalcy coming back. So, well, Katie, we want to say thank you again to you. Um, really appreciate all your insights today and for, and for coming and joining and spending a morning with us. Uh, hopefully it was enjoyable. Yeah, absolutely. It was so much fun. Thank you so much, guys. Of, of course. All right. That will do it for us today. I'm Scott Babcock. He's Daniel Mendonca and she's Katie Lucas. And we will talk to you later. See you later, everybody. Have a good one. Thank you for listening to another episode of the If You Build It, Will They Learn podcast. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Join the conversation by emailing us at podcast at haylight.com. Find us on social media at Build It, Learn It, and be sure to check us out on the web at www.haylight.com. That's H-A-L-I-G-H-T dot com.